Hey Megalithomaniacs, how are you? So here we are at Stonehenge on a beautiful July summer's evening with our Megalithomania group. But it's just such a delight to be here. We've got the whole of Stonehenge to ourselves, which is unique. It doesn't often happen. We have the whole site, usually you share it with other groups. So we're gonna just have a few moments on the outside, have some quiet time, and then we're gonna get into the the nitty gritty, the real information, the real secrets of this amazing site. Well, I was going to say, obviously, most of the population that you have that built Stonehenge and, and uh, existed and lived around here was normal size, but there are some uh, intriguing accounts, uh, particularly 1719 account of a nine foot four skeleton and some somebody's admonition to keep it, uh, be, you know, for pro, uh, posterity because it was so alarming. But um, you know, the, the entire story of Stonehenge is evolving in real time. Now we have um, information that there are new finds underneath the ground, that the post holes, the, the original planning of Stonehenge seems to go back maybe to eight or 9,000 BC. stone behind me is to me one of the most interesting here at Stonehenge you can clearly see it's got what are called polish marks or striations all the way down it now and the large recumbent stone as well we get that in the main circle here and we also have like what looks like here I'll show you another image you can't see it, it's in the shade like a shepherd's crook like we find in Portugal Karnak and other places as well as these strange features here and potentially like a nub, like a protrusion off, off the edge of the stone. So this particular stone is really, really interesting. This would have formed one of the outer stones in the main circle. But when you look at these, look at this, you can clearly see this is almost like the stone has been softened. This is really hard sarsen stone that came from West Woods about what, 40 or 35 miles away. And you can see it glistening in the sunlight because it has crystalline qualities. But in tradition, in a certain tradition, there's a story about the Kanjik giants. Now these were a tribe of giants who potentially resided in Somerset, but were also present in Wiltshire. And they were said to have built Stonehenge as a trophy when they defeated a rival army. And they were supposedly the earlier Kanjik giants were of like divine origin and they were like semi-human divine beings and the later were these warrior these fierce warrior giants and their remains have been found teeth bones skeletons all over the west country including near Stonehenge so whether they were actually real or this was uh, just a legend which was reported on by a Reverend Robert Gay in 1666 we wrote his book The Fool's Bolt Shot at Stonehenge which was really a kind of uh, slightly sarcastic overview of what had been written about Stonehenge but he gave his version of it bringing all these legends to life but this idea about the Kanjik Giants is really interesting because one of the things he wrote about which he said was an old legend and was that they powdered and softened the stone and then carved them and then they hardened them again and this is much like the Cyclops of ancient Greece and so they also said Stanton Drew was done in the same way because it's like conglomerate stone like with uh, pebbles within it and so we're getting these traditions in Somerset, Stanton Drew here at Stonehenge and we must remember this is the same design same style we find at Oyente Tambo in Peru as one quarry in Egypt when they were carving granite and Machu Picchu in Peru and other places, suggesting this technique was known worldwide. So it just gives you a hint about why this site might have, might have been called the Giant's Dance, which was its original name. Now we're going to detail in this in our minor Jim Vieira's book, The Giants of Stonehenge in Ancient Britain. But this here to me is like the smoking gun of Stonehenge. It really provides this evidence that these legends may be true and that they were softening and working with the stone in a way we don't yet understand. You know, we know who built Stonehenge, who they were, how they lived, why they built it. Somewhat of an open question. I mean, at least the more esoteric aspects, but it's what's stunning to me is that the vastness of the site, there are burial mounds every direction, everywhere you see. 
And of course, these the, the people who built Stonehenge were predominantly of normal size, but there were some outliers. There's some burial mound accounts from the 1700s that are well at a normal range and may have been part of this group revered as rulers or or God knows what, it's just an outlier. But there are several burial mound accounts from the 1700s of uh, one of an over seven foot skeleton and one that's nine foot four that, you know, defies imagination, but that, that's what was recorded. So, you know, you, you get a lot of uh, ideas that, you know, giants built the, the Stonehenge. It was called the Giant's Dance originally, and, and there's all this myth and lore around it, which is very interesting. And with giant accounts around here too, I would, uh, you know, postulate a different theory that there, there may have been some large uh, rulers associated with the building of this, but uh, not built by actual giants. I think uh, that's a, um, you know, a folklore memory, but who knows? And it's just uh, interesting, really uh, interesting site to visit. <laughs> so this recumbent stone is one of the other ones that really fascinates me here at Stonehenge. You've got huge scoop marks going in the length of the stone and then smaller scoop marks going across the side of it. And even over there, we've got a blue stone with like a parallel groove going down the middle. And there's another stone we're going to look at when the sun's moved around a bit uh, on the outside, which has got like these sort of spiral kind of scoops and carvings. So we're going to have a look at that. So, so when the, as the sun moves around during the year, suddenly these things appear in the stones and only a few are left. I mean, this would have been standing up, so when the sun would have moved around at certain times of day and year, you would have seen it then, like you can on the stone we first looked at. And so there's a whole shadow play going on here. There's something that Terence Meadens looked at, but it's also, there's more to it that's actually shapes in the stone itself. Like you find at Oyente Tambo, you find it at Silastani in Peru, uh, Machu Picchu, and you can see that much many of them structures have the same principles and the same design in some cases, like the windows at Machu Picchu are like the Stonehenge Trilithon. So there seems to be this design spec. Oh, we've got a bird just landed there, one of the rooks. And there's a lot more going on here than people realize. A lot more subtleties, stone carving reliefs, nubs, striations, and other such things. So if you can get inside Stonehenge, either during the Equinox Solstice or one of our private tours, these things are really, really interesting to see close up. You don't see the, these when you come here on a standard ticket. So yeah, let's keep looking around, see what else we can see. Another stone here that Dan Stevens has just pointed out to me that there's some kind of spiral striations kind of going around on the outer stone here. This is the one that's almost in line with the summer solstice sunrise heading towards the heel stone. But Dan here has just pointed this out. Right and uh, yeah, look at that. Can you see that? Let's get close. Yeah. That's natural or not. So here we have the kind of sun's just starting to hit this now. You can still see it, it like spirals up. This is the, is this the one with the face on it? Or is the one next door is, isn't it? No, this is the one with the face. Yeah, yeah, this is the one with the face. So here we have it. We're just getting the sun on it just now. So is this another piece of evidence of like the striations? And then we've got, so this is the one with the face. So if we just step back, this is the famous one with the kind of big face. So whether this is broken off since it was built or whether this is actually the original is really, Really intriguing. Look at this. So there's something going on here. Just down the side here. And then here as well, according to Dan. So what you're seeing here then, so you're seeing like chip marks. Yeah, you can't really see this one's much more rough hewn, it's still got lichen all over it. But it could be something here, yeah. That is interesting. So this is the one with Straight, you can see some of the striations have kind of come out here, kind of in the light, in a certain light as it moves around. It's very interesting. Can't see them so much, most of it's in shade, but you can see some of it there. So we're just leaving Stonehenge. It's been a beautiful visit here on this summer's evening. 
It's a real treat to be here. We're gonna have our book out, The Giants of Stonehenge in Ancient Britain, which is gonna cover much new information about very intriguing aspects of this site. But today we've been looking at the Kanjik Giants, the mythology, and the fact that in tradition, giants were said to have brought the stones over from ancient North Africa to kill a Rus in Ireland where they stood for thousands of years. And the whole area there at Kilarus has got Punchtown stone, it's got like uh, many other earthworks, you know, like a Neolithic landscape really. And then, according to tradition, Merlin brought the stones over from there to here. But this was after a 15,000 strong army controlled by Uther Pendragon and also King Ambrosius couldn't move the stones. They couldn't move them, they couldn't replace them, they couldn't get them you know do anything basically so Merlin used his tricks his gears some, some say he used engines or slight or magic and he brought them over here but and this is when they were known as the giant dance so this is the Welsh it was choir gigantum this is where the name originally came from and so there is this really strong connection with giants with this site not just the Geoffrey of Monmouth tradition and Merlin but also the Kanjik giants amongst other things and of course we know there's a whole bunch of skeletons being found in this area up to 14 foot 10 inches tall so much to think about when you visit Stonehenge and this sacred landscape we thank you for watching please subscribe click the bell icon check out the new book and become a patron if you can take care megalithomaniacs we'll see you next time